Vibrations Podcast, Part 35, Pete Spurrier. Hi, I'm Gary Brightman, and this is my bi-weekly podcast called Vibrations. Established in 2018, Vibe is a book and music shop situated in Moi Wo on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. So, what's been happening at the shop recently? Apologies for the radio silence. Over the past six weeks, we've been moving from our flat of 12 years in Taite Tong to a house in nearby Wang Tong. We packed 120 boxes and along with our furniture were both brilliantly and efficiently moved by the local guys of Sunrising. They moved us 12 years ago and I can't praise them enough. They're just bloody good professional movers. They took down and put up TVs, dismantled cupboards and all for a very fair price. I'd recommend them to anyone. During this time, Vibe stayed open every single day as it has done for almost two years straight now. Thanks to the Vibettes, my more than capable crew. We deal with increasing numbers of donations, largely books, but CDs, DVDs and vinyl also. We now stock recycled Risola sunglasses. Shirley Johnson, who also runs such brands as Lantau Ren and Tong Fooker in Vibe which cover towels, t-shirts, mugs, umbrellas, cufflinks and much, much more, is also behind Resolar sunglasses. Made from three to four recycled plastic bottles, they have UV 400 polarised lenses and are in many different cool designs for all ages. September and October were quiet months for us. Things have picked up a bit more in November and hopefully the Christmas and both New Year's seasons will help further. We're not just a book and music shop these days and have all sorts of other gift opportunities in stock for all ages. Our first event since the Funkophones played a storming gig at Vibe in October will take place on Saturday the 11th of December at 2.30pm. Les Bird, ex-Hong Kong Marine Police Officer, who wrote the very successful A Small Band of Men, has a new book out, Along the Southern Boundary. The book covers a frontline account of the Vietnamese boat people and their arrivals in Hong Kong during the late 1970s right up to 1997. Given the limited numbers of people we can safely fit in the shop, the talk will be broadcast live on Facebook at 2.30pm. Just follow the links from our Facebook page at Vibe Silvermine Bay. As well as local authors and artisans, we look to promote local musicians and singers at Vibe. So if you fancy performing a tiny desk gig at the shop one Saturday or know someone who may do, then please contact me directly. And so to this week's interview. Pete Spurrier is the author of three guidebooks for exploring Hong Kong's wild and interesting places. The Serious Hiker's Guide to Hong Kong, The Leisurely Hiker's Guide and The Heritage Hiker's Guide. He arrived in Hong Kong by happy accident in 1993 at the end of a journey along the Silk Road through all the newly independent stands, which he only embarked upon after an old man in Greece gave him a decades-old map of Central Asia. He ran out of money when he crossed into northwest China, but another stranger told him that he would probably find work in Hong Kong, so he hopped on and off trains to get across the country to Lo Wu. He's had many jobs, including acting in TVB dramas, managing an unlicensed restaurant, teaching Vietnamese boat people and editing a free magazine. Nowadays, he runs Blacksmith Books, which has published more than 100 titles on Hong Kong, focusing on culture, history and the life stories of its people. The first flat he rented in Hong Kong was in Silvermine Bay, and he still returns to Lantau for hiking. Welcome to Vibe, Pete. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Good, good. And as we do, we'll start with the ten questions. What is your favourite book or author? It's George Orwell. I always really liked his writing style. And I'll choose uh, Down and Out in Paris and London because it was an inspiration for me to travel. uh, Even when you've got no money, you can still do it. I I slept rough in Paris. uh, Did you? On the the first uh, week I went backpacking in the rain in October. And I found a place where a load of people sleeping on the street. Local vagrants. And I thought this looks safer. And... uh, 
made a place in my sleeping bag. And uh, then one guy comes over uh, to, to say hello, in French obviously, um, which in England would be done with a bottle of cider, but he had a <laughs> bottle of champagne and we shared it. Wow, well, yes. that's, that's Paris, isn't <laughs> oh, that's, it? That's Those Paris tramps, <laughs> they are so <laughs> much better off. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Do you have a favourite musical artist? Yeah, David Bowie. Of 34 interviews, probably crops up the most, actually, Doesn't I would really. say. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well deserved. Do you have a favourite drink? I do actually. I I love a pint of Guinness. Yeah. Uh, but it's rather expensive in Hong Kong, isn't it? So I don't it treat is. myself as often as I would like. And so uh, yeah. special then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> special occasion. So yeah. we'll have one after this today. Yeah, I dare say we will actually. Yeah. Sol over there does <laughs> yeah, Guinness. Yeah. Do you have a life motto? I do try to follow the maxim: um, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. Might, yes. might be an army thing, the six Ps, it really sort of um, yep. is a framework for getting stuff done. Favourite Hong Kong walk? I think I should choose something on Lantau, shouldn't I? Because that's where we you, are. You don't yeah. have to. You're, you're I mean, if you have something that, that's typo orientated, you can throw Actually, that Actually, I, I have two favourite walks, and they're in opposite ends of Hong Kong. One is the Bat Sin Leng. Would you know that one? The eight Immortals Range in the Northeast New Territories. I should do, but um, I don't. I it's like, well, it's called eight Immortals because it's eight peaks in a row. Okay. But it's actually 11 peaks in a row. Uh, the name is a bit uh, misleading, yeah. but it takes you right up into the wilderness of the Northeast New Territories where you can see everything for miles around, um, really high and airy. Um, and there's a similar one on the southwest coast of Lantau when you go up Lingwishan above Fan Lao. Yes, Fan Lao Fort. Tip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and when you're looking down on Fan Lao from there, you can yep. then sometimes see across to Macau, you know, you see yes. high up. Uh, and then you can come down to Taiyo. And again, yeah. that's, a, that's a walk that'll take a few hours and yes. you won't see anybody. It's, it's wonderful, a real sort of get away from the city. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That Actually, a lot of people that live here on Lantau will say that's their favourite yeah. walk, and I enjoy that one. It's very sort of almost jungly in places, it is, isn't it? Isn't yeah. it? It's and, kind and of you've got abandoned anywhere. villages, you've got the fort, as you say. Yeah. There's, there's a temple on the on the shoreline there. Yes. Uh, it's, it's got everything, really. Yeah, it yeah. has. Do you have a favourite Hong Kong restaurant? I do. I would choose the Taj Mahal in Chunking Mansions. Ah. Uh, third floor, block B. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Because it was the first place, bizarrely, even though I am English, I come from England, um, Chunking Mansions was the first place I ever had Indian food. Really? Yeah. That, hey, yeah. Uh, I can't, I can't uh, uh, figure out why. Yeah. Uh, I came from a small town. We didn't even have an Indian restaurant. Can you imagine how small that yeah. town must have been in England? Tiny, yeah. yeah. And in that place, not even the music changes. They play the same music every night. For Do they? 20, 28 years now. Yeah, that's, 28 it's, it's, years. It's a lovely thing to go back to. It is, yeah. <laughs> Faced with a python whilst walking up to the peak. What would you do? Right, I would sort of um, freeze and then walk backwards very slowly while yeah. making a smiley face, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, try to be its friend. Um, I did once meet a python while doing that Fan Lao walk on oh, Lantau years okay. ago. Okay, yeah. Um, but it was dead. Uh, but oh, I didn't know that. So I, I came yeah. around through the tall grass just Shit. north of Fan Lao on the way to Yi O, and there's a yeah. python lying there. <gasps> oh, Bloody uh, hell, yeah. But it was dead. Yeah. And uh, next to it was a dead dog. And I spent oh. a while trying to work out what happened. Yeah. Uh, whether it had choked trying to eat the dog. Yeah. But it wasn't. Or the dog had killed it. Or the dog had killed the it. Dog. And then it had bitten the dog. Even though pythons aren't poisonous. I, I still no, don't know that's the true. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. yeah. But, they're constrictors, uh, aren't they? They're constrictors. And uh, it seemed like it wasn't. Um, uh, it didn't have its jaw open. Yeah. Uh, as if it had choked on the dog. Yeah. And I'm sure it would be quite good at swallowing dogs anyway. It's, it's their sort of main skill, isn't it? It is. Small dogs, so, they normally are yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good fare for them, aren't they? In fact, Lantau's quite big on snakes, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, um, very big. Because on yeah. the Chima Wan Peninsula, uh, yeah. here a few years ago, I met a king yeah. cobra on a very yeah. narrow path. And yeah. In that case, it was coming towards me, and I froze, and I think that's the right thing to do. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, what was the best advice you were given? I can tell you the most effective advice I was given, or the advice that changed my life. Yeah. In, in the in the uh, sort of uh, most most um, fundamental way, is when I was on the way to Hong Kong, following the Silk Road from um, west to east from London through twenty countries all the way here. Yeah. I didn't know I was coming to Hong Kong. That wasn't my destination. Okay. I was just trying to follow the Silk Road. I crossed from Kazakhstan into northwest China, and then found that the little bit of money I had left wasn't going to get me any further because wow. China was much more expensive than the previous countries yes. had been. Yeah. And I was a bit stuck there in a town called Urumqi, which is the most landlocked city in the world. You can't get further away from the oh, city. God. It's right in the middle of Asia. And I didn't know how to go, you know, forward or backwards. Yeah. And I met an Australian woman uh, who said, why don't you go to Hong Kong? You could probably find a job there. 
And I thought, yeah. oh, okay. And I didn't know where Hong Kong was because my yeah. map had already run out. My map only extended a little bit into China. That's interesting. So I knew Japan and Korea were over there somewhere. Yeah. But there was probably a bit of sea in the way. Um, you can't cross that very easily with no money. Um, but Hong Kong was... Uh, I could get there by land. So I followed her advice. So I sort of yeah. jumped on trains without tickets all the way across China. As soon as the ticket collector met me, I pretended I didn't understand what he was going on about, got off again, got on again, did that all the way across China to get to Hong Kong, walked across wow. the border, uh, and she was right. I, I could find a job here. Yeah, uh, I got three job offers on my first day of trying. Uh, that's so. an incredible story, <laughs> yes, Pete. And, and, I, and so gutsy, actually, to go down through a country which you knew nothing about yeah. and blag it on trains. I, I quite enjoyed that, um, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose after a while yeah. it becomes yeah. a, a thing, but to start well, when you yeah. think, well, what's the first time they catch you? What are they going to do? It takes a long time, actually, because these intercity yeah. trains in China, this is before the fast trains, yeah. right? before the bullet trains, whatever, yeah. high-speed trains, the trains are so long that go between cities. Uh, you know, you can find out which way the ticket collector is walking, and then just walk away from him yeah. until he finally gets you. It can be hours. Yes. And in that in that time, you've gone quite a, a distance across China. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Get off the train. Try again. Get on again. <laughs> so it worked. Actually, it worked. The, the only the only part of this um, plan that didn't work is that when I got out, uh, um, uh, when I crossed the border into Hong Kong, across the bridge into a Low Wu station. Low Wu, yeah. Um, didn't have any money, and I thought I'd just be able to walk or hitchhike to Kowloon. Yeah. But you're not allowed to step out of the station without a ticket because it's in the oh, closed. Oh, okay, right? right. So all I had at that stage was uh, a traveller's cheque for ten pounds. That was the last thing I'd left, Gosh. which I couldn't exchange in the um, station. Yeah. And I tried to leave the station a few times, and the police they said, "No, no, no, you can't leave the station. You've got to buy a ticket." Well, I haven't got a ticket, so I was stuck in London. Yeah. Um, a bit like you know the sort of those people who've been stuck in airports for years. Yeah. Uh, I thought this might happen. But one of the policemen said, you can ask that woman for money for a ticket. And he pointed at this woman selling newspapers. So I went and said, oh, sorry, no money. Can I, you know, miming it, actually, because I didn't speak any Chinese, obviously. Um, and she gave me the money to get a ticket to wow. Kowloon. Um, unbelievable. It is unbelievable, actually. And what is even uh, more unbelievable for me is that I forgot to go back and pay her back. When yeah. I got to Kowloon, I, I was straight into, well, big city, what, what can I do now? Where yes. can I find a job? Where I can find a place to live, yeah, and I forgot to go back and pay her the um, twelve dollars. Uh, um, she might still uh, be there. Ticket. She might still be there. <laughs> she might be do that regularly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds <laughs> like it. Kind. If the policeman yeah. pointed her out, yeah. she probably did have form. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. I mean, the policeman wouldn't do it, but uh, no. Newspaper woman would. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose the policeman giving you a bribe might be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the done thing. Yeah. How yeah. does that work? <laughs> okay, so we'll perhaps yeah. we'll talk a bit more about that later on, but. Um, that's unbelievable, actually. That's a long answer to your question. Which it's was, a good um, answer. Yeah, what was the best advice you've got? Yeah. So it wasn't great advice. Uh, well, actually, it was good advice to come to Hong Kong because I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. You know, um, so that that can be the best advice. I've well, I think lesser had. people would have panicked in northern, northwestern China to get through the vastness of that country down to Hong Kong without spending a penny, as it were. Yeah. I, is 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 unbelievably. Uh, brave and crazy and unlucky, you yeah. know, because at any point in time you could have been incarcerated and then yeah. deported or That's whatever. True. You That's and true. then and I was panicking at some stages because I really didn't know how I was going to get home. Yeah, um, the, you know, this is the days before bank cards or anything, so I, was, I was just had the cash I was trying yeah. to and that had run out. Yeah. So it took, I think, fourteen days to get across China. Right on the train. Fourteen. Fourteen days. days. So this is how my money was frittered away on on buying you know um, food on the trains. Yeah. Uh, so I only had a traveller's cheque left by the time I got here. But I also had to sleep on the floor of the trains. You know. Yeah. And compete with people for space on the floor of the trains. Um, yeah. So I put my sleeping bag down. People were spitting sunflower seeds and peanut shells oh. all over me. Uh, I sometimes slept in that gap between carriages. You know the, where the uh, oh really metal plates move up and down. Dangerous. A bit dangerous. Yeah. But, um, less crowded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then really cold at night when it's going through. Like the, the desert in northwest through. China, the air's coming through. And it's, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's travel, isn't it? There's a story you know, in that. Different things, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to your book, actually. Thank you, Pete. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to get going on it, boy. Okay, so um, so that was good advice then, wasn't it? Was it? Good advice in the Go end. to yeah, Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah. yeah. Go to Hong Kong. I don't Kong. know who that woman was, really. Yeah. You know, uh, but it was, uh, you know, um, she knew that she'd been to Hong Kong before. And she knew that yeah. if you had a 
British passport or Australian passport in those days, you could work without a visa. Yeah. So it was good advice. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, so last couple of questions. Why do you I'd stay in Hong Kong? These days yeah. I stay in Hong Kong because almost all my friends are here. Yeah. And that's okay. really, I, I do think friendship is a really important part of life. Absolutely. Uh, that some people yes. neglect, they forget yeah. about friends, you know, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm always very aware that you do need friends yeah. in life, especially as you get older. Definitely. So, uh, as most of my friends are here, sadly a lot of friends are leaving at the moment. As yeah. Everyone in Hong Kong is having this experience. Yeah. Uh, but while I've got friends here, I, I think I'll stay. Yeah, good on you. I, I would totally agree. I think, you know, friends are important. Friends are therapy. Friends are good feel good yeah. feel bad whatever you yeah. know situation and, and you actually live longer don't you I friends. think so it's good yeah. for your mental health and yeah. your longevity favourite area of Hong Kong um, the islands are nice aren't they yes um, I don't get out to the islands as much as I would like now uh, because I live in Taipo yeah. which is also a very nice area it's a small market town yeah uh, I travel more most often these days you know in these times of COVID-19 you can't travel anywhere else it's got yeah. to be inside Hong Kong uh, to Saikung that, that, that's where nice. yeah, it's got the same sort beautiful. of benefits as the islands you know you've yeah. got coasts and beaches and sampans yeah. to offshore yes islets and things that's really nice and restaurants and yeah yeah and still kind of uh, I like areas of Hong Kong which have retained their Hong Kongness. yeah and it you has, know it? Yeah. yeah it really yeah. has I think that corner of Hong Kong but also you know places like Sham Shui Po yeah they would be m- m- relatively unchanged I can say Moi Wo yeah, and Lantau is pretty much unchanged for yeah, the whole duration. And yeah, that connectivity, I think, there with the past is quite a it cool thing. It is very thing. nice, yeah. Saikung still seems like a small town. Yeah. Even though it actually isn't anymore. Yeah. You've got so many small little restaurants and shops. And whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and independence. Independence, yeah, 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 yeah. which is, is really good. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't live there, though, because it's um, such a faff to get there from the city, oh, so it's yeah. good to visit. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's the best way to do it. Okay, good. So that's all the questions. All right, um, I can go home now. Can you I? can go home, Pete. Yeah. yeah, well done. You've passed. <laughs> You've got nine out of ten. Out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sounds quite good. It's not bad, really, is it? As they were your questions, your answers. <laughs> so, um, I want to rewind back to you know we spoke a little bit about you coming down through China and I detected something there that you were saying your ambition was to follow the Silk Road what sort of year are we talking and and what motivated you to do this in the first place yeah it was um, 1993 I arrived here so it would have been 91 that I left home to start this journey because it took two years to go two years through Europe and the Mediterranean North Africa the Middle East Silk Road stopping on the way working here and there yes uh, took uh, yeah almost exactly two years and I think it was 21 countries 21 yeah. countries it was a wonderful thing to do actually yeah. so I started it I just turned 19 so I just started it then it was meant to be my yeah. six month um, tour of Europe yeah. before going back you know like right. a gap year or whatever yes they just kept carrying on it's still going now you know? <laughs> <laughs> never actually went home it's um, reaching a very good uh, conclusion yeah, doing I think doing quite well yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was the, I think the best thing to do to grow up really yeah and to have an education in real life very definitely yeah. and I think quite brave at the age of 19 a lot of us don't know our own minds at that age and we're still too gobsmacked with girls or whatever to yeah. do anything and drink um, but for you I've seen a few pictures of your trip you seem to be with another couple of guys are they people that you left with that you intended to travel with or did you meet them on the way well I, I was in Tending to go um, traveling with a couple of schoolmates because okay. I just left school and yep. we were all going to do this, you know, and then they dropped out. So mm-hmm. I ended up going on my own. So I got, you know, bought a tent, a backpack. Right. The family all waved me off at Folkestone Ferry Pier because this was before the Channel Tunnel. You know, yes, so of course. I had to get through to France. Yes. And I did it on my So I started on my own. And I was, like, like you say, I, I was um, um, actually I was not at all grown up then. I was, I was not at all old for my age. I, I, was, yeah. um, I didn't know how it was going to work. Yeah. So I was just a bit foolhardy. Yeah. Um, and then France was cold and rainy when it started off, um, but I just stuck my thumb out on a road and I thought I'll try hitchhiking, yeah. and it works. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I could, it seemed like I could go anywhere. Yeah. Um, the first driver who picked me up was um, a school teacher, a woman um, in her thirties probably, driving. You know, you remember the old little um, two CVs? Oh yeah, yeah, two <laughs> CVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so um, she she was happy to pick up this you know sort of gangly stranger yeah um and my schoolboy french worked so yeah. we had a nice chat along the way and I, I just said where are you going anywhere is fine for me so she just drove me to where she was going then i yeah. uh, got onto another road and then another hitch yeah hitchhiking ride and yeah. it seemed like it worked quite well yes yeah so, and then when um staying in different cities i was sometimes 
sleeping in my tent wherever. Sometimes I stay in a youth hostel. Then you'd meet other backpackers and you'd find okay. out you're going the same way. So you travel together for a while. Right, um, right. It worked well, quite well actually. So yes. it was an easy way to meet people. Yeah. Um, I, I, I miss hitchhiking actually because it was a great way to meet local people. Yeah. And get their sort of um, um, Take local on. knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd often say, oh, don't go there, it's terrible, go here, you know. Yes. Or I have your dinner. Or, uh, sometimes they'd buy me dinner. Yeah. Or whatever. It was a nice. real uh, way to find uh, local hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. Because I guess that would be my two main worries about it would probably be the security of it. Mm. Um, you know, that you're going to get robbed, mugged, or even worse. Yes. Uh, and, and, and the other factor that would worry me would be the sort of loneliness factor and you seem to get over yeah. both of those problems well but I, I did get robbed and mugged uh, you know, really so it is a risk you've, okay uh, you, uh, traveling is a risk yes uh, when I look back on it now I'm amazed that my parents let me go yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't realize the risk at the time but they must have done yeah and they were happy to let me go anyway which must have been quite difficult very I didn't difficult. think about it at the time yeah. no uh, and of course uh, in those days there was no phones uh, no emails. No. So I was just sending postcards home, you know. So that that's how they knew where I'd been, not yeah. where I was. Yeah. Because that took time to get there. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I would say, you know, in two weeks' time, I'll be in uh, Madrid or Rome or Cairo. Can you send letters to the post office there, and I'll pick them up? Okay. That was the way you communicated right before. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very modern much. sort of tech. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So they had no idea where I was from day to day. No. Time couldn't afford to call home because uh, I, I did a few times but and uh, reverse the charges but you had to go to a telephone office yeah then sit in a booth and wait for the call to be connected that's right it was very I remember expensive. those days yeah I remember yeah. It being international calls international calls wow. it was like a, a pound a minute or whatever yes for, yeah forever so didn't yeah. do that very often so yes yeah, so loneliness um, was a thing but yeah. that's why I enjoyed meeting other people and traveling with them yeah yeah and that, that was that was a good solution actually and uh, just a great way to meet people from around the world who are yeah. uh, either in that country, from that country, or who are travellers in that country uh, yeah. and are strangers like you are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I found it, I could even work it out in, in some ways. I met up this one guy, I think he was from Wales, who was um, cycling to India from Wales. Right? <laughs> I met him. <laughs> a, do, a, yeah. a, a hippie, like long, yeah. long, long hair, um, uh, daffodils in the, b the back of his bike. You nice know. one. N nice guy. Yeah. Uh, and we, we met up, we got on. So he was cycling, um, we were going in the same direction, and I was hitchhiking, yeah. and we'd arranged to meet up in each city. He'd cycle and I'd hitchhike there, and ah. it generally worked. Brilliant. You, know, uh, you, you wouldn't have thought this was possible, but no. it <laughs> generally worked. But that's yeah. a nice, that's the sort of thing that does motivate you and spur you on then, isn't it? Because yeah. like, I wonder if my mate's going to be exactly, there, or yeah. I'm going to get there first, or yeah, yeah. whatever. Uh, and then we ended up uh, going f through three countries together, actually, Tunisia, Italy, and Greece. Okay. Um, and then he taught me how to um, live off the land when we got to Greece. Okay. Um, I was, I'd run out of money because I, I was maybe six months into my trip. I'd made money working at home before I left, you know, yeah. a Saturday job and whatever. It'd run out, I needed some work, but um, the tourist season hadn't started in Greece yet, that was what I was aiming for. So uh, I arrived okay. in Corfu Island yeah. in maybe March or whatever it was, yeah. uh, and there was no tourists, there's no people actually, they'd all gone to the mainland. Right. So he carried on, he, you know, on his way to India, Yeah. but before he, he did that, he showed me that, um, oh, these are wild leeks growing here behind the beach oh. so I cooked wild leeks on my, on my fire for wow. every night for a couple of weeks that's amazing uh, picked wild figs yeah. uh, uh, almonds right uh, that sort of thing yes. uh, so it was, it was good to meet people like him yeah. who'd done it before and he showed me that you don't always need money yes. to get along yeah you, know? yeah, you can you, get you, by without you can, yeah, yeah. The, the world is you know, uh, a fertile place yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah I mean that's, that still just makes it even more incredible I think that you, you know you you have run out of money, and, and normally, for other people, that would be the sign to quit. You know, yeah. I, I need to go back as soon as yeah, yeah, I yeah. can now and get reached sanity again and, and get fed up by my mum or whatever. Um, but but then I guess was there a balancing time for you that you said right now I'm more on the other side of the world, I'm spurred on to keep going, or were you always for going forward, never well, going back? The more, the more I went, the more I was enjoying it and yeah. discovering new places. So okay. I did think, I was thinking like, how far east can I get? You know, yeah. uh, and I just kept trying. Um, yes. So the excitement uh, won out over worries of, yeah. will I find a job to make some money to buy some food? Yeah. Uh, it was all a big adventure. You know? Yeah. And when you're 
I was 19. It's you know, the, and when I'd worked out the hitchhiking worked, I could pick food from here for free. That I could sometimes get work along the way. I thought this is you know actually easier than I expected. The yes. world is open to me. Yes. you know, to travel and, yeah. and see it. You know, it, I yeah. don't need a lot of money. It, was, it, it works anyway. Yeah, I, I had to be quite. I, if if you do this, you have to be quite willing to be hardy. Yes. You know, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I had a tent. I slept in a tent most yeah. of the time. Um, uh, it, it was cold sometimes. It was rainy. Yeah. But for me, it was just. Um, life really you know, it's like yeah. real life and I was really enjoying it yeah you know? I mean living life to the full really yeah. at that age I mean there's a good lesson for everybody there in a way yeah. and I think it's all lessons yeah yeah and I think you also probably get the value of people are the same it doesn't matter where they are they have the same yes. values and yes and people are kind actually yes oh, this was this is a great um, experience for me that I learned that um, strangers will often help you yes uh, so so before this um, before arriving in Corfu with uh, with you know money run out um, I'd come from Italy um, yeah. and I got everything stolen you know uh, oh I was I was God. sleeping in a ferry pier uh, in my sleeping bag with my head resting on my backpack yeah and my head hit the floor and I woke up and someone had nabbed my pack, oh. and so all I had was my sleeping bag and the clothes that I was sleeping in. Oh, um, Jesus! So um, I just found a piece of rope and I wrapped my sleeping bag up in it and slung it over my back, and I carried on. I actually felt better because I didn't have this burden of a big backpack that I'd left home <laughs> with, which didn't need. Actually. Yeah, you know. So fair I, enough. I, le- I learned this as well that you need very little. Yes. Um, and I had five pounds left at that point. Um, which I knew I was going to need to get the ferry to Corfu to find some work with. Yeah. So I hitchhiked across Italy, just going in uh, bakeries in the morning. Okay. At, like five thirty in the morning when they're opening up and yeah. saying, "I learned how to say in Italian, you know, good good morning. Uh, do you have yesterday's bread, please, for me?" Yeah. Oh really? Uh, and they'd always give me today's bread. Oh yeah 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 today's bread. Oh yeah yesterday's cake sort of. You know, you know. Really? Uh, would always help out. It was very very nice. Indeed. They're very yeah. generous people. These very generous, Italians. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My sister yeah. lives in Italy. I know that they're very. But uh, as you say, I think. People help people, don't well, people they? Help people, yeah, they yeah. see people, yeah, yeah in and, need, and, and um, that works in several countries. One, I didn't have, have yeah. work. I'd, I'd go and you know ask for food in the bakery, and you know wouldn't wouldn't make a habit of it. But um, when yeah. I needed it, people were willing to help. Yeah, me. well, you wouldn't um, do it unless you needed it. Unless you needed it. And at that time, when I um, I, I had my backpack stolen, um, I thought you know there's nothing of value in it except clothes yeah. and a camera and my diaries, right? Yeah, and, and I was so. Um, heartbroken to lose my diaries. Yeah, more and, so. And the yeah. films that I hadn't developed, yet, oh, the camera films, right? Yeah, so, that would um, destroy me. Yeah, yeah, because I'd met lots of people uh, and, and I'd written down their addresses in my diary. I wanted yeah. to stay in touch with them and diaries had been ah. stolen. So I spent a day or two because I thought as soon as um, somebody had run away with that backpack, they would have, you know, knifed it open, gone through, found there was nothing yeah. in there, thrown it in a bin. Yes. So I went through every bin in the city, right, looking for my oh. diaries and the films, right? Yeah. Because uh, they were really important to me. And while I was doing that, People came up and gave me food because uh, I thought I was looking for food in a bit. Yeah, it's really charming. That, that is very, charming, isn't it? <laughs> really, really, yeah, really, yeah, uh, yeah. Very, very heartwarming, actually. Yeah, that is um, very heartwarming. And there was even one other guy, a local guy, who was sifting through a bin for food, and he came yeah. across and, and tried and to give me food. Some yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is you know, wonderful, actually. You know. It is humanity. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it is, is humanity, like yeah. that. Yeah. I think yeah. you know my belief is. You know, ninety percent of the global p- population is exactly in that frame yeah, of mind. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I didn't know that until I'd sort no. of put myself in that social position. Yeah, you know, right on the bottom rung. And yeah, people were kind to me. It was well, really that wonderful. that yeah. that time of vulnerability, really. You know, it could have gone really pear shaped, sure. but it yeah. but it didn't. That the globally people held you up. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So yeah. what a nice feeling. A nice feeling. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not not all good. I mean, uh, as well as being robbed, I, I was I was arrested by the police in Italy and they beat me up uh, really yeah um, stripped me uh, and they paraded me through the station laughing at me and then beat me up throwing tables and chairs at me what? Um, yeah because they thought um, um, I'd been involved well I don't think they thought but the night before um, a judge in a motorcade had been blown up by the mafia this was oh in Palermo, God. Sicily yeah and that e- I didn't know about this. That evening, I was climbing into a train carriage at the back of the railway station, parked, trying to sleep in it. Right. And a policeman saw me, thought I was going to plant another bomb or something. So you know, oh my god! I actually fired a shot over my head. You know, after shouting something wow. at me, and I froze, thinking he might not have seen me. He fired. He must have thought, you know, this is a 
Jeez. another mafia thing. So, you know, yeah. I got taken to the police station and beaten up, you know. I understand why. It was fine. Well, but it, so it wasn't yeah. all, uh, you know, happy go lucky. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You had some incidents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was life traveling through, you know, Russia, the vastness of Russia and cold. You're on trains most of the time. Are you going through Russia or are you hitchhiking? Well, just south of Russia, actually. So, yeah. so it was, um, um, I think it was just the year after the Soviet Union had fallen apart. Right. So it was all these new republics yes. that I went through on the Silk Road. Yeah. All the Stans, you know. Yes. Um, but there were lots of Russians living there. Yeah. But it wasn't part of Russia anymore. Okay. And it was actually very hot and arid. It's sort of desert ah, there. okay. So uh, the opposite. The difficulty there was that when the Russians had, um, when the Soviet Union fell apart, um, those stands weren't really ready for independence and they didn't have any yeah. distribution systems of food or water or anything. Okay. So the, the government food shops empty every day, literally empty shelves, people yes. queuing up outside yes. and hoping that something would be delivered. No water in the taps. Um, so I didn't oh drink God. for days and days at a time. Wow. And thirst is really um, something you oh, can't ignore. No. You know, hunger you can get yeah. get over. Yeah. Uh, but thirst is something else and that, that's yeah. crazy. And the people who live there, they sort of get around it by... Um, um, swapping stuff with each other like bartering food okay. and drink yeah yeah but if you're travelling through it doesn't work you know? no it can't um, work I suppose yeah, can so it that, yeah you've that, got that nothing really to difficult. give yeah yeah wow so yeah travelling yeah. through a very yeah a trouble torn country is a, yeah. yeah yeah and in those stars another they, issue. they were also they hadn't set up borders yet border yeah. posts mostly so I was able to just go through without visas I didn't right. apply for visas <laughs> but every now and then I got caught I got asked by a policeman on the street, passport, yeah. so I didn't have a visa, so I'd have to either pay him yeah. or spend the night in the cells, yeah. you know, and then pay him. Yes. You know, which, yeah. which would you choose? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hear so you. I then ended up getting deported from one of those stands because I was found there without a visa. Right. Um, and they just deported me to the country next door, for ah. which I also didn't have a visa, but the <laughs> country let me in, bizarrely. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of logic. But at least they were going, going forward, you were still going, they weren't yeah. going backwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so that's, that worked out well. <laughs> yeah. I was, luckily, you didn't get your passport stolen that time. Very lucky. I always wore a yeah. money belt. You know, uh, around, yeah. my, around my uh, stomach so yeah. uh, I was lucky I was wearing that in my sleeping bag when everything yeah. else got stolen yeah. good God uh, it was actually very liberating then to have just um, clothes and a, a sleeping bag on a rope uh, it's, yeah. it's like wow what, what a weight lifted off my yeah. uh, off my shoulders but also off my mind Yeah, I was always worried about losing my camera Yes, <laughs> when I lost it, you have to worry it's about gone. It it's gone. <laughs> yeah, what else can they take? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit like that image of sort of Tom Sawyer, isn't it, with it the, is with the twig knapsack. and the little knapsack yeah. on the yeah. end? That was yeah. you. It was. Yeah. But and in fact, that was you for two years. Mostly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So unbelievable. I, that's how I arrived on Corfu with just this uh, sleeping bag on, on a rope. <laughs> uh, then I stayed in Corfu for a summer. When the tourists started arriving, okay. I started doing hair braids on the beach for girls, you know, oh, putting beads in hair, and that, yeah. that was good money for a, yeah. for a summer, just living on the beach, you know, so I didn't pay rent for a whole summer, Excellent. Um, and doing these hair braids, um, and then when it was time to move on, when the summer ended, I bought myself, I didn't want to, um, I knew I was going to carry on travelling, yeah. but I didn't want another backpack, yeah. so I just got myself a little satchel, like for, for you know, okay. schoolboy sort of yeah, satchel, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that was enough, you know, yeah. a place for a camera and a diary, and a change of socks and whatever, yeah. and a yeah. hat, and, and that was it. It's yeah. good enough. Yeah, and then yeah. the, the travelling light is much, much more enjoyable. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, I think, yeah, because yeah, that's the... You're doing a lot of these things on foot as well, and yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. weight to carry. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes hitchhiking doesn't work; you have to walk a long way. Before yeah, you yeah. Get a ride. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that was a period of your life from 1991 to 1993. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you came to Hong Kong in the most unusual of circumstances. I, I'm sure that has happened probably a lot for Chinese nationals. Yes. But for sure. have done yeah. that trip, but and for more a, dramatic ways, a lot of people swam here, you know, yeah. uh, to avoid the border. Yeah, yeah. and and done that touch base thing yes. and, and, yes. and all that. But you, you did it as a Brit down through China uh, uh, um, at that time without paying a penny. You arrive here, so you cross the border at Low Wu and you finally get out of the station, as yeah. you say. You get into Kowloon. What's the first thing you do? Well, the first thing, I'd, I'd heard that um, Hong Kong was a place where you could find a job. So yeah. I thought there's got to be uh, um, something I can do here. I didn't know what, though. Yeah. Um, but first I had to find Kowloon, actually. Yeah. So I didn't know where it was. You know, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have yes. a map. So the train ended those days at 
what they now call Hong Hum, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 the other way around, isn't it? Now it's called. I can't. Anyway, Hong, wherever. Yeah, like wherever the KCR power. used to end. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where I got off. Yeah. And so I was looking at the harbour. Oh, great! Which way is Kowloon? Oh, no, so I just. Luckily, I turned the right way. I turned right along right. the harbour. Yeah, yeah. Along the... And thought I'm going to have to find a place to live first. Yeah. And it was really steamy. It was September. Um, I didn't know it, but a typhoon was on the way in actually. So oh, I thought this time of year, yeah. so you could feel that humidity in the air. Yeah, that yeah. Sort of Whipping up. Yeah. Um, and also, I was a little bit um, culture shocked, to be honest. After yes. the stands had been really hard work, right? Yeah. Because yeah. not only was there no food and drink, but as um, I look Caucasian, right? Yeah. The local people there who are Turkic uh, or, or yes. Tajik or whatever, they thought I was Russian. Right. Oh. And they don't like Enemy. Russians very much there yeah. because the Russians really did ruin their environment yeah. by um, planting cotton fields there and ruining yes. the water table. So people used to come up to me on the street in the stands and try and swing punches at me. Right? Really? While drunk. Oh uh, my god! All the time, and uh, I had to learn how to quickly shout in Russian. Whoa! Stop! I'm not Russian. Yeah, then, I'm oh, English. Yeah, yeah, I'm English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, well, the they, little Union well, Jack. I, I am I, English. I, I did actually say that because then they used to say. Um, you know, Don't after, believe you. After, after, after <laughs> I said uh, I, you know, I'm not Russian in Russian, they said, yeah. "Oh, where are you from?" Then and I'd say England, Anglia, and they'd never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> so, so that, that, that pierced my ego. Right, you're a Russian. <laughs> yeah, then. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I ended up saying America. Oh, America. They, they knew that. Yeah, uh, okay. But, it, but yeah. it was hard work. It was hard work yeah. going through the stands and then through China as well, and then you know not eating very much. Also getting really ill because when I was so thirsty. Yes. Just off a railway platform, there was a girl selling. Um, Milk from a bucket, right? Okay. And loads of men queuing up to drink from this bucket with an enamel cup. Okay. And you know, it hadn't been pasteurised. Everyone was sharing the same mug. I knew I was going to get ill if I drank that milk. Yeah. But I was so thirsty, you had to do it anyway. Oh my god. So then, of course, I'm really ill. You know. Um, you know right. Uh, for days. Um, so it was hard. It was hard work this journey. Yeah. So when I, and, and also then in China at that time on the second the second half through China was easier because people generally left me alone in China. Yeah. Except in those days, which isn't true anymore. People would stare at me all the time in China, right? Um, um, yeah. Stop what they're doing in the street and stare at me. Form a gaggle around me and stare at me, stare into my eyes without blinking. Because oh white that's... people generally weren't seen in those days. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that's disconcerting, now. isn't Quite it? Quite disconcerting, very... yeah. I, I caused a traffic accident on the street one day. Yeah. I was standing on the street corner thinking, where is the railway station? Which way is it likely to be? And I could see out the corner of my eyes a guy driving this sort of um, tractor sort of contraption, driving in one direction and bending around to look at me. And then a guy on a bicycle cycling the other direction and craning around to look at me, and they both went whap. You know. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. And then the guy on the tractor jumped off and started beating up the guy on the bike. What? <laughs> yes. And it was all good. <laughs> I'd been, I'd been the cause of this distraction, you know. So it was a bit like that. That so, is unbelievable. I mean, yes. that's the sort of thing of um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. You need a film, you get a camera <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when I got to Hong Kong, um, I was a bit uh, sort of still a bit weirded out, still a bit you know culture shocked. Yes. So I wasn't ready yet to go and look for a job. Yeah. Um, so I thought I need to just chill out for a few days. Yeah. So I, um, I had this traveller's check, right, um, for ten pounds, last money I'd left. Yeah. So I went to the. I thought this will keep me alive for a few days. So I went to the yeah. bank to change it, and, and the, the bank said, "Yes, we can change it, but the um, the commission is five pounds." So, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so, so I got Mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got five pounds. So. Um, that, that that you know got me food and drink for a few days. Yeah. But it's not enough to uh, um, rent a bed anywhere. You know. Um, no. But luckily, I found um, just walking up Nathan Road uh, in TST and walking up a few stairs, I found a flat roof rooftop. Okay. So I lived there for the first week. Or, Did or, you? Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was quite nice. Um, yeah. Until this typhoon hit. Yeah. yeah. When and I didn't know what was going not on. Not a place to be. Not yeah. Not a place to be. Yeah. So I was sleeping on the roof and I was um, to stay hidden. You know, I, I was across a little the parapet on a little ledge yeah. looking into the windows of the Hyatt Regency that used to be there oh. and I was quite enjoying the fact that I had the yeah. same view as them yeah while I yeah paying them. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant so, so one night the, the um, and I didn't have my tent anymore because that had been stolen right, along with everything else so I was just in a yeah. sleeping bag on the, on the roof uh, one night the rain really started coming down quite yeah. hard and I was woken up by it and I thought okay I'd better run for the, um, the stairwell you know yeah. so I climbed over the parapet onto the main roof and I was running for the um, for the uh, the little sort of hut where the stairs go down yeah. not realising that I'd been sheltered by that wall from the wind okay. and as soon as I ran out with my yeah. little satchel on the back and sleeping bag wrapped up in a rope the wind sort of lifted me up a bit and oh I, I almost went over the edge because I hadn't realised the strength yeah. of these typhoon winds yes. that come like horizontally yeah. across the roof then came down into 
CST, that was about five in the morning, all the neon signs had fallen into the street, you know, it was Jeez, quite a big Yeah, it was a biggie, yeah, yeah, it was a T8 or T10 maybe. It, yeah, maybe a T, I can't remember now. T10 I can, I can look back and work out the date. Walked down to Star Ferry and there were flying fish jumping out of the, the harbour. It had <laughs> washed in from somewhere. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What a sight. Uh, what a sight, yeah. So... My money ran out on my um, 21st birthday. Right, right 21. Um, so I bought myself a can of Guinness. Right? Yeah. <laughs> to celebrate with my last $8, I think. Yeah. So I went to sit in Cowling Park um, and, and toast myself, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thinking, okay, after this, I'd better start looking for a job. Uh, no idea where to start because I'm literally, you know, I look like Jesus, uh, you know, yes. long hair, long beard, uh, yeah. wearing rags. Uh, yeah. You know, no one's going to want to employ me, really. Well, you had no um, CV or <laughs> no track record, did no, you, really? No, You'd left really. school and then hit exactly. the road. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what experience did exactly. you have? Exactly, and I didn't know what was available in Hong Kong either. I knew there wasn't the sort of um, farming work I'd done before, picking oranges or um, doing hair braids on the beach or yes. nothing nothing like that. But I was sitting there having a, this can of Guinness in Calvin Park on a bench saying, you know, happy birthday, me. Yeah. And this, this woman walked past and, and looked at me, and uh, I could see her stop and I looked at her, and she said, Pete, what, what are you doing here? What? And it was the woman I'd met in Northwest China no. who told me to come to Hong Kong because I could find a job here. Yes. Unbelievable. Life, life is this weird sometimes. That is unbelievable. Yes, yes. And so her question was, what are you doing here? And I found it was actually a really... Um, yeah. Was, uh, you told uh, me to come well, here. Struck me down that question because it was a good question. I didn't have the answer to it. Well, you <laughs> told said, me well, to come here. That's why I came here. here. Yeah. I didn't, didn't, didn't come out of that, that blame first. No. I said, well, I'm not sure really because I was still a bit, you know, uh, um, trying to cool down from all the, um, the stress of... Yeah. Situation really, and she said, "Have you got anywhere to stay?" And I said, "No, no, no." And she went, "Oh, come stay with us then." Um, she was staying in a, um, a wow. travellers hostel, backpackers hostel, yeah. and she said, "The guy who runs it is really nice. You know, he'll let you stay until you get a job." Um, so I went with her, and she introduced me to the guy running it, a Sri Lankan guy running this this hostel. Yeah, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move in, take a bed in that dorm there. When you get a job, you pay me." Yeah, like How that. good is fantastic, that? Fantastic. Yeah, again, humanity. Really? Humanity. Yeah, yeah, humanity. yeah, yeah. Just, just you know, people you, you don't know yeah. from Adam. Yeah, they're going to get know? nothing out of it yeah, necessarily. Yeah. You could do a runner. Yeah. So I, 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 I walked into that dorm, you know, I took a bed. There was a load of people in there already. Introduced myself. Um, yeah. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go and out and try and get a job tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll have to have a shave, you know, and have a shower. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and find some clothes. And one guy said, oh, borrow my suit then. You know, so no. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I borrowed a pair of shoes off someone in another dorm. Yeah. So the next day, got smartened up, put a suit on, uh, walked up Nathan Road, knocking on the doors of English schools to see if they needed teachers. Wow. And the three that I knocked on said, yeah, yeah. I got three job offers on, on that same Really? Day. Yeah, so it was as easy as that. It was fantastic. Like, Hong Kong was really booming then. Yeah, early yeah, 93. early 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah it was that, the time to be. Yeah. It was, those years before the handover. There was yeah. a little bit of a sort of a charge in the air. No one knew yeah. what was coming. Yes. Uh, but everyone was like trying to make money before it did happen. Yeah. Like, it might have been. Yeah. And so my first job was teaching English then um, <laughs> to local kids and adults and also Vietnamese boat people. Who, oh, um, yeah would come into Yamate to the school I was working in on Nathan Road yeah. to, to be coached on their citizenship applications for Canada. Okay. Because they come in as refugees, like yeah. um, five, ten years earlier. Right. They were living in, like, um, I think they called them open camps at that time, where they'd have to sleep there. Yes. They could come out and work in the day. Okay. And they were trying to get into either Canada or Australia or Britain or America or yeah. France, uh, you know, New Zealand, before 97. Because yeah. I think China had said it wouldn't. Accept any boat people still being here, right? Then. Yeah, they so had they to were deal with it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I was coaching them on their sort of Canadian embassy uh, citizenship uh, interviews, okay. which is really interesting because I knew nothing about this at the time. No, um, yeah, and I wish I'd stayed in touch with those people because yes. I hope they got there. But in those days, it was harder to stay in touch, you know. Yeah. And, um, I didn't have a... Um, I was living in a backpack hostel. I didn't want to tell anyone at the school that. Yeah. You know, how could they, you know, have faith in yeah. me being, you know, highly qualified as a teacher, yeah. which I'm not. And yes. wasn't. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I had no um, fixed address, uh, no phone in those days, no phone number, no wow. email. So I just hope they got to yeah. where they wanted to go. Yeah, you know, having an English native speaker there you know that <laughs> had a few world experiences <laughs> yeah, <so laughs> having travelled there some, their chances. yeah some references <laughs> so you're doing that from sort of 93 onwards how, how long does that where does that take you to yeah I, I did I, I, I taught English until I lost my voice which took about nine months um, okay because um, a lot of the classes I was doing were conversation with adults right where they just um adults would come in any time of the day and join the class and i would just chat okay i'd get the newspaper and chat about the news yeah i found that really valuable actually to learn about hong kong as well yeah so when i was 
teaching them English or just chatting with them in English, I was asking them questions about Hong Kong, right? These yes. are all um, yes. um, business people or, you know, um, air stewardesses sometimes, uh, marine policemen, um, housewives, uh, you know, all sorts of people. Came what to a great parties. term of reference. Well, yeah, and I just say, yeah. okay, what did you do at the weekend? Uh, what food do you cook when you, when you, you, yes. know, when you, you get home? You know, um, where do you go when you, we have some spare time? So I learned about Hong Kong yeah. people sort of a society From, by doing that. Yeah. But there was so much talking that I, I literally lost my voice after nine months. So I thought, I'll have to find another job now. Or I've said everything Amazing. I can say. Yeah. So I ended up getting a sandwich round, yeah. like, which was a big thing in those days as well in the mid-90s, delivering sandwiches to offices okay. at lunchtime. Right. Which was a great deal because all, all the sandwiches that you didn't sell, you'd get to take them back to the hostel afterwards oh, and good. sell them to your mates at half price. Oh, or brilliant. eat them yourself. Yes. Uh, and it actually was a better hourly rate than being a teacher, believe it or not. Really? Yes. Says something, doesn't it, really? <laughs> it does, doesn't, doesn't Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, yeah. First comes food, then comes education. <laughs> yes, it does. Well, there you go. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I do remember one day walking through yeah. Wan Chai with my basket full of sandwiches, dressed in shorts and T-shirt, and meeting one of the students from the school that I just left. Yeah. And he went, oh, hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Your career's on the up, is it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't to know I was actually making more money. But yeah. it looked like the opposite, right? How unbelievable is yes. that? <laughs> yeah. So, wow. so then I went on from there. Actually, then the guy who was running one of these sandwich rounds then opened a little... Um, illegal restaurant, I suppose. Okay. So I, I, yeah. I, I managed that in the evenings for him, a vegetarian restaurant, which was yes. new in those days in Hong Kong. French yeah. and Greek and Turkish veggie food mostly, but no license. So yeah. it was just like close, to, a bit like what you'd now call a um, private kitchen. So yeah. I did that and then moved on to working in bars as well. During all this time, actually, I thought yeah. I was only going to be here for a few weeks to make enough money to then go back north yes. through China and get okay. the train home. Okay. But the, the longer I worked in these jobs in Hong Kong, the more fun I was having and the more people yeah. I met. And I kept thinking, yeah. this is great. You know, yeah. I'll stay another month. Oh, yes. just another month. Yeah. Oh, just another one. And it's okay. carried on till now. Yeah. What makes you then get to the stage where you can set up Blacksmith? Yeah. Well, that, that didn't um, happen by plan either. Actually. No. I, I did be. several other jobs before that. I, I, I was yeah, being, what sort um, of jobs did you do? Before? Being like an extra in Hong Kong movies, you know, they'd always okay. need like white faces to be yeah. the, the full guy. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, doing yeah. Um, all, all sorts of weird things. I ended up starting up a magazine with a friend of mine because I was doing freelance editing um, for a while. Um, right. And my friend was doing freelance like house removals. And yeah. We were both taking adverts in other magazines to get work. Then he said, why don't we just start a magazine? Yeah. Uh, and send it around, and then we can put our adverts in it for free. That was the entire yeah, logic. Yeah, yeah, well, that makes so, sense. So we did that. Yeah. Uh, it became a free magazine, and it went uh, for five years. That, that, that was right. quite good. It was, it was, what was uh, it called? It's called The Town Crier. The Town Crier Man magazine, okay. yeah. So it must have run from uh, 1999 to 2004, maybe five years. That was a totally different um, um, frame of like, like working and living. You know, yeah. Different people through that that yeah. I would have met otherwise. That was quite nice. Then SARS came, right? Yeah, and 2003. 2003, yes. So, yeah. And then because we were a free magazine that depended on adverts, all our advertisers were places like hotels, um, restaurants, travel agencies. They all went bust, and so we did right. as well. At that point, I didn't know what would be the best next move. I thought, I like running a magazine. You know, uh, I might like to do another one, but this yeah. is not the right time because there's no adverts. Yeah. So yeah. there were three people who'd been writing for our magazine, and they all had book ideas. Okay. Uh, right, to put books together so I thought oh I can I, can, I know how to do sort of publishing and printing yes. and design or whatever I'll help them do that then that'll um, keep me busy for a few months ok you know, who were so. those three people can you tell me or yeah um, an illustrator called Lorette Roberts Lorette uh, Rod Roberts yeah, ok yeah, who, who, who sketched scenes of Hong Kong life the, the street yeah. scenes um, and she used to do illustrations from a magazine yeah. Um, and she said, oh, I'd like to do a book about Soho District, you know. Yeah. So oh, I can help them. Yeah, Very there. colourful area. Yeah. Then Nicole Laid was our restaurant reviewer. And she wanted yeah. to do a book of um, cheap restaurants in Hong Kong, like Guidebook. Yeah, yeah. And then Sarah Woods wrote columns about how to um, uh, have days out with your kids in Hong Kong. Okay. And so she wanted to put a, together a guidebook about you know, where to go as families. Yeah. I helped them put these three books together and, you know, got them... Um, printed and in the shops, and yeah. uh, didn't know what would happen then, but they all sold really well. Um, you know, okay. which is lucky because yeah. not all books do, but those three books all did well. So I thought, oh, I'll carry on with it. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. you know, books is um, um, a thing I can do as well. You know, yes. um, so I, I was later to learn actually that um, in publishing in general, I think like in the West, like London and New York, big centres of publishing, I think eight out of ten books fail, lose money, right. and two. 
make yeah. enough money to carry all the others, right? So I was very, and I found that here in Hong Kong, my ratio is much better than that. I find that yeah. seven out of ten books I do succeed, and three don't. don't that's, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah. But how lucky is it then that the first three I did did succeed? Because those first three could have been three failures. Yeah. I don't want to stop there and then. I would have thought yeah. this is impossible. Yeah. There's a hell of a lot of work to do to put a book together before you ever got it on a bookshelf. Yeah. And it's only at that point you find out whether it meets. Um, the, the needs of the readers, you know, right. whether it strikes a chord of people. Yeah, uh, it's a complete um, gamble. Yeah. So you were your part in the publication of those books was the sort of the formatting, the, and then the word processing part, and then yes, and then finding. Out. I mean, Hong Kong's not short of printers. Yeah, 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 and also a publisher sort of takes the risk as well. You yeah, know, um, the financial yeah. risk, and then pays royalties to the author if it sells. Yeah, yeah so that's what I did there. That's yeah. the sort of traditional. Yes. Uh, method, uh, and I've carried on with that. But now it's been yeah, it's been um, um, a long time. It's been maybe eighteen years even. Yeah. Um, so I, so I didn't plan it. No. But, uh, and, it, and it's um, it is quite a hard trade to succeed in the book selling world. You've got to find places to sell your books. You yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad to know you, Gary. And yeah. I'm so delighted that you yeah. put my books on your shelves. Oh, well, absolutely. Say. Yeah. I put your books on your sh- my shelves because. Every one of them I would buy, and I do buy myself and Lovely. read myself. Yes, you do. I know you have to. Somehow <laughs> yes. we're in sync on our <laughs> yes. taste. Yes, I absolutely love the things that come from Blacksmith Books. Lovely, um, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I appreciate your support, and, and you know, small bookshops in neighbourhoods around Hong Kong. It's, it's the yeah. way to go, really. And this is why I've always focused on books about Hong Kong. Yes, and not try to go wider than that because yeah. when you go on more wider subjects, you're competing with big publishers from overseas. Yeah. So it, it's just a small niche, but it does generally work. I think children's books as well you do very successfully, don't yeah, you? Yeah, with a local angle. With a local angle, way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, with an age angle. And, and certainly we get many f- parents in here saying, I'm going to a party, I want a bunch of kids' books, but I really want them with a, with a Hong yeah. Kong yeah. twist. I want the kids to be able to relate to them. That's right, and learn something about and where they live. And learn something about where they live, yeah. yeah. And if they've got some green environmental things in there, also good. Even better, you yeah. Know, even better. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you've been going for 18 years, Blacksmith Books. How many titles have you got? I think about 140. Yeah. 140 yeah. titles? Yeah, yeah. And where do you pick up authors from? Do they just come to you? Generally, yeah. I, I, do you know, when I um, um, thought I would carry on with this, after those first three books did well, I thought, oh, I'll carry on with this. Yeah. I actually sat down on a piece of paper and I thought, these are the books I'm going to commission. Yes. Right? Yeah. But I never actually had to because from day one of sort of setting up the office, submissions came in of manuscripts. Yeah. And uh, from all over the world, actually. Uh, really? Uh, always, still, and still do. Um, a lot from America and Britain, especially really? and India, as okay. well as Hong Kong, um, and you know, not um, there, there's only a tiny percentage of them that I can publish because yes. I get hundreds a year. Yeah, yeah. And you I generally choose. publish ten or twelve a year. You know, what I've had to do these past years is just uh, look at these things that come in and work out if um, I could succeed yeah. with any of them. Yes. And I, you know, you never know for sure, and sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. But generally, if the subject matter is Hong Kong or China or Asia related. Yeah. And if I can work out a way to present it properly, yeah. it generally can can succeed. Yeah. 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 And has and, and has at least succeeded enough that I can carry on doing it. Whereabouts are you based, Blacksmith Books? You're I'm in Fort Town, an Fort industrial Town. area. Yeah. I, I was on Hollywood Road for a long time in a walk up. Okay. Uh, on top yeah. floor of a walk up. Uh, that was in my office for about eight years. Yeah. Until as this is Hong Kong, right? Yes. The landlord came and said, "Oh, you know, uh, you're a great yeah. tenant, but we've got to raise the rent." Um, and they tripled it. <laughs> yeah. We like you so much. Yeah, exactly. We feel we can so, steal another two thirds so off of but, you, <laughs> but not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Hong, so I Hong said, Kong. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I took the cue to move to an industrial building, yes. which is actually a lot more practical. Yes. So it's got big goods lifts, so I can get those little sort of um, um, forklift things in with pallets okay. for books, and I can yeah. send books out quicker and get them in from the printer easier yeah because logistics nice. yeah. are a big problem aren't they with books they're yeah, heavy they're yeah. heavy they're heavy and you need space to store them you which need you space. don't have in Hong Kong yeah yeah. Um, so I'm in one of these old 1970s industrial buildings which was built originally to make plastic flowers plastic toys uh, for export to the west yeah. you know made in Hong um, Kong made in Hong Kong exactly. back yeah, in the yeah, 70s yeah. and now they're, they're great actually because you've got tall ceilings so you're able to build shelving quite high yes uh, they're just basically concrete shelves but yeah. they really work they're very yeah. practical and nowadays you find that all sorts of businesses are in these industrial buildings. Yeah. So in my one, um, next to me, there's um, 
I think there's eight units on my floor, so I'm running a publishing company. Next door, there's an import-export company. Next door to that, there's a, a, a warehouse for oranges, <laughs> for the orange juice factory downstairs. Brilliant. Next to that is a pool room, yeah. uh, which I think is just for rich kids at night. They rent it just to be there in yeah. this room. Uh, there's a photo studio. Downstairs, there's an organic Italian restaurant without Brilliant. a license. There's a techno disco. Uh, uh, only on weekends, yeah. uh, which is full of French teenagers. How they hear about it, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's great actually. It's yeah, really that that is yeah. a very Hong Kong model, it really isn't is. it? As you it really say, is, yeah. and I love those big warehouse buildings with the big wide lifts and yeah. you know the the well, big yeah. scale to yeah, them. The mechanical there. stuff that works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're like Lego Meccano <laughs> exactly, exactly. sets or whatever. When, when I moved in, uh, when, I, when I looked at the place, the landlord, really nice guy actually, a local um, local guy. Um, he said, I, I think you'll like this. You're, you're an English uh, man, you know, you'll like this office because look at the, look at the view. And it's true, uh, I've got these sort of tall windows, you know, it's all, you know, 50 years old, it's built in the yeah. 70s. But we're looking out on um, these, the, the mountains uh, behind Chartin, with okay. like, uh, you know, granite outcrops on them, oh, little nice. villages studded here and there. Yeah. And my landlord says, look, it's just like Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> It's not completely wrong. Just it like is quite Scotland similar. Without the snow, it's quite similar. Yeah, and so I, I really like it because I get a lot of sunlight in. It's, it's very yes. nice. Um, so that was that stayed the same for about four years, and then of course this is Hong Kong. A housing estate got built in in my view. But you know, oh that's oh yes, happen, I saw isn't that it? on Facebook. There you go. Yes, thing. yes. Yes, in fact, didn't, not only that, didn't you get the quarantine blocks I, going up? Exactly, because those before that public housing estate was finished, it was then used as the government quarantine um, yeah. uh, um, towers, and I was sent to them to, to go to quarantine. So uh, opposite your own opposite company, my own office, your yeah, own place of employ. Exactly. Last <laughs> last March, it was just after COVID started. Actually, I went to have oh lunch God. with twelve people, and one person at that table was then diagnosed uh, with COVID, so all 12 of us had to go to the government quarantine uh, for only two weeks. It wasn't the three yeah, weeks that was now the case in the hotels, still, but it was still a bit... It's a long time. It, it wasn't much fun because it was an unfinished public housing estate, by which I mean the floor was still rubble, uh, you know. Um, right, OK. Um, there was no, no sort of fittings, fixture and fittings. Uh, it was just a small unit. Yeah. You know, um, and I could sort of see my office from it. I thought, oh, oh, I wish I was there and I could you know, actually get some work done. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I brought a laptop in with me, but I was so annoyed by being trapped there. I was demotivated. Yeah. So I didn't get much done. I yeah. just paced up and down every day like a well, tiger in a cage. Yeah, you know? it is, it's, yeah. that's the danger. That, that's the thing that happens to people, really. The world closes in on them. And yeah. I talk to psychiatrists here, and they say, this three weeks isn't working for people. Right. After about 16 days, people do tend to close yes, in yes, and then deal. struggle to deal in society when they come out. Yes, yes. Not normal, it's, is it? Yeah, it's not normal. It's the yeah. big unspoken kind of thing yes. you know elephant in the room that it no really one is, talks yeah. about yeah and, and especially not being able to open windows and get fresh air yeah it's everybody really, says uh, that yeah yeah it's physically difficult as well as mentally yeah 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 okay so look getting back on track um some of the books that we sell here what you what are your most what are your best sellers would you say at the moment maybe top five or whatever I, oh, I couldn't possibly say. No. Yeah, no. Because okay. uh, um, I'm not doing know. my job, am I? I'm not, <laughs> if I did my job, I'd give you the figures, wouldn't I? Right, right. Yeah, that's true. I'll let yeah. me just check my notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd say one of, the, one of the first books I published is one of the ones I'm still most proud of, actually. The one we were chatting about earlier. Yes. Uh, King Hoy, the man who owned all the opium in Hong Kong. Yes. Written by Jonathan Chamberlain. It's a true story about a man in Hong Kong, a local man who lived through all the most... Um, um, up, upheaving years of Hong Kong's yes. history from the 1920s to the 1990s. Yeah, he, he was here during the Second World War. Um, yeah, and he, he, he's an actual. Um, he's not necessarily the nicest of men. Peter Hoy, the book is about. He's a playboy. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, he's a womanizer. He actually collaborates with the Japanese and, and admits does. it very unusually. Yeah. But while you listen to his story and, and, and a lot of his bragging, you get a lot of the colour of what Hong Kong was like in those years. Yes. So Jonathan Chamberlain interviewed that guy over. Um, uh, dinners on Cheng Chow over many months yeah. with, with a, a, you know, a, a voice recorder, and and spent a, a year or two putting it together. Yes, and I'm very glad he did. Yeah, and I'm very glad he brought it to me to publish. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. I think it's a great um, um, element of social Hong Kong social history. It, it is. I mean, I would absolutely. That was the first thing I said to you, wasn't it? We we rearranged this meeting many times, and um, it, it, I said, look, really, I've just finished that book, and. I would say here we are in October. 
it's by far the best book I've read this year. Wonderful. The, the King Hoy book, the story, the way it takes you, as you say, through 70 years of, of Hong Kong history. It's a real social document. It is. But with a bit of spice in there as well. A lot, a lot well. of spice. <laughs> a and, lot of spice. And you don't know if he's always telling the truth. No. Because he is a big-headed yeah. man. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a playboy. He was born rich. Yeah. Then lost it all, then gambled and made money, then lost it again. It's an yeah. up-and-down story. Yeah. Uh, but whether you believe him or not, yeah. it's a good story. Isn't it? it's, a gr- it's a great yeah. story. And I would urge anybody that... I'm going to be pushing that book ha- mm. hard from here on in. Um, just because it is the best book I've read probably in a couple of years actually yeah, so really yeah. enjoyable yeah, one of my favourites as well yeah. yeah any others that you would pick out Pete do you think or? Well, I'm looking at your lovely shelves here now actually you do a yeah. lovely display of all sorts of books about Hong Kong yeah uh, so there's a good place to come to look, to look yeah. at them, isn't it yeah. yeah that's right so we we will always stop blacksmith books we love to support you we are a local independent you're a local yes. independent thank you very much we're hand in hand um how do people get in touch with you what what's the website and the yeah if anyone wants to have a look at these books about hong kong because there's there's more than 100 uh, uh yeah. up there it's blacksmithbooks.com can't yeah. say easier than that can yeah, you really just look for blacksmith books on any social media yeah yeah yeah, yeah. same on facebook yeah. you'll find it under exactly. blacksmith books yes. or just pop into vibe here and, yeah and uh, have a look at the shelves yeah. yeah yeah pop into vibe and we will have increasing amounts of blacksmith books here i think that is from good here news. on in <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> okay that just remains for me to say pete spurrier thank you very much for coming thank you for having me Our next and final podcast this year will be a Christmas special. Martin Molden will be interviewing someone posing as Gary Brightman. You can listen to all our Vibrations podcasts published on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Amazon Music, TuneIn and Alexa, Stitcher, Listen Notes, Player FM, SoundCloud and a few others. Or you can watch on our YouTube channel under Live at Vibe HK or follow the links from my website at vibehk.com. The opening and closing music is from my good mate in Tong Fook on Lantau Island, Pete Millwood. It's called Green Island Dub by Celestial and it's on the Retrospect vinyl album on sale at Vibe. Finally, a reminder that Vibe is open seven days a week, every day of the year, from 12 noon until approximately 6.30pm. Well, that's it for another week. Thanks for listening to the 35th Vibe Book and Music Shop podcast called Vibrations. I'm Gary Brightman. You get my vibe? Can you imagine what this old island must have looked like to those Dutch sailors when they first saw it? A dream of a new world. They must have held their breath. Afraid it would disappear before they could touch it.